Good afternoon. I'm Noel Waghorn. Welcome to this news briefing from the 250th National Meeting and Exposition of the American Chemical Society in Boston. We're joined at this hour by Dr. Kimberly Hamad Shifferly from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and she's going to talk about a new paper based test for Ebola and two other infectious diseases. Dr. Hamad Shifferly. Welcome. Great. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. So uh, I'll tell you about some of the work that we did just very briefly about what we wanted to create. And so we were interested in a, a rapid diagnostic for infectious diseases. And so um, many of you have seen a lot of um, infectious uh, rapid diagnostics. They're the same thing as a pregnancy test. And uh, what we wanted to do was uh, uh, give them new capabilities using nanoparticles and nanotechnology. So um, uh, lateral flow tests are really great because you just put sample into them and you can read out by eye very quickly if you um, uh, are uh, have a disease or, or are pregnant or um, and so on. And so uh, the majority of these tests that you see, I mean, there, there are a lot of advantages in that they're very cheap. Um, you can put them in your pocket and um, uh, they're very easy to use. You practically don't need the instructions. But what we wanted to do is to make one that could uh, distinguish uh, what disease you had. And we're really uh, interested in infectious diseases. Um, we're all familiar with the outbreak in Ebola that um, was very uh, dire last year. But we're also in, uh, interested in things like dengue, which has a huge disease disease burden, um, which impacts on the order of um, you know, 2 billion people uh, in the world. And so we were, wanted to make a rapid diagnostic that could tell you what disease you had, um, but uh, test for multiple ones at, a, at the same time. So every, every test that you see typically that you can buy right now can only test for one thing at a time. And we wanted to do one that could test for um, uh, three. Uh, or maybe four or five, and so uh, what we did was just took we just took advantage of the fact that nanoparticles um, have different colors if you uh, make them in different sizes, and uh, so if you uh, put nanoparticles on the antibodies that are inside the test, um, it gives rise to a different color on the test line. So if the test line is green, it means you have dengue. Uh, if it's orange, it means you have yellow fever. If it's red, you mean it means you have Ebola. And if it's blank, you have uh, none of them. So that's basically a picture of an actual test strip um, that has those nanoparticles in there giving rise to different colors. So just to give you a sense of what it looks like in the housing, I brought a prop right here. This is an actual prototype of a test that we have uh, made. We basically made it in our laboratories using 3D printing. And on it are strips. This one is a single color one, but I thought it'd be useful to show you what it looks like uh, in actual size. And um, it has uh, uh, nanoparticles inside it, and that's what gives rise to the, the color when you have a positive or negative test. Um, and so this is a, yeah, something you can, uh, you just rip open, you put in um, human uh, serum, and then you look for a color, and that's it. You can either read it by eye, or you can take a picture of it with your cell phone, cell phone camera, and that can also um, uh, provide the diagnosis. All right. Do we have any questions? Please state uh, name and affiliation beforehand. So it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. Um, just to ask, what are the next steps to commercialize this technology? And also, do you have any idea what it will cost? Right. So um, in terms, that's a great question in terms of where we want to go with it. We actually, I mean, our main goal with this is to get this in the hands of as many people as possible who will use it. So we're looking into uh, commercializing it right now. So obviously we make everything by hand. We can only do this on the small scale. Uh, we are uh, talking with uh, companies to see other, you know, different options for making it commercially available. Um, in terms of cost, our real goal is to make this as inexpensive as possible uh, for diseases like dengue uh, because it has such a huge disease burden. Uh, we want to make this as accessible to as many people as possible, so we're trying to drive down the cost. Uh, currently, right now, uh, this, for example, this test has four strips. Um, each strip is about five dollars. So this is this test would cost about twenty dollars when we make it in the lab. Uh, we think that with mass production, it can reduce the cost somewhat. Um, and so we're obviously uh, we're hoping that once these are produced on a larger scale, that it would be even cheaper. Just one, one second. Can you? Okay. Just to follow up on that, how, how exactly would you drive the costs down? 
Right, so the um, obviously in terms of manufacturing, when you 3D print something, it's much more expensive than a mass manufacturing capability. So if you were to injection mold a whole bunch of housings, it would be uh, considerably cheaper. Um, the main cost for this is in the antibodies. Antibodies are very expensive, and so uh, if we um, we're trying to improve the sensitivity of the device by uh, manipulating the nanoparticle properties, and we're hoping that that would allow us to use uh, fewer antibodies per strip. And so we think that will hopefully drive down the cost as well. Martha Heil from the Maryland Nano Center. Can you talk a little bit about why the nanotechnology, how it detects each disease? Sure. So um, basically at the heart of all of these uh, devices is an antibody that will bind to the biomarker of interest. And that's where we get the specificity of each line. So the way we can get, for example, a green line um, is that we take uh, for, for dengue, and if you, um, you just basically have to have an antibody that will bind to the biomarker for dengue. And so the different colors uh, come from uh, the fact that we link to that antibody a nanoparticle that is green colored, um, and then we do the same thing for Ebola. We take a red nanoparticle that binds to an antibody for Ebola, uh, an orange nanoparticle for one that binds to yellow fever. Um, and that's um, the, the color dependence of nanoparticles has actually um, been very well studied. And so, the, for example, if you look at a stained glass window, all those colors um, in there are due to, or many of the colors are due to nanoparticles. And people knew that if you changed the formulation of the, the silver or the gold, you would get different colors. So it's actually very, very old. Other questions? Question from online? Back behind you there. Christine Saez, yes, news service. Um, I'm just wondering about the shelf life of the, the strip and how long would it last in, say, if you send them to sub-Saharan Africa and in a non-air-conditioned um, clinic or something like that? Yeah, that, that's a great question because we can make a device that works really great in this extreme air conditioning environment in Boston mm -hmm. with electricity, but uh, what's it really like in the field? And so uh, we have, the, I think the big killer for us is humidity. So we do a lot of environmental testing in um, humid environments at 37 degrees C, and uh, we find that they don't work as well. So we have been working on packaging. It's actually not very... Um, uh, complicated. We use foil packs to seal them, and they have been stable for up to three months um, in a humid and 37 degree environment. Um, but of course, once you open it, you have to use it right away. Hi, um, uh, Nelson Toto from Botswana. I just wanted you to give us an impression in terms of the quantities of the nanoparticles that we are using and the impact that you think this would have on the environment, given that you'll be making a lot of these units and they'll be disposable. Thank you. That's right. So the, um, in terms of the nanoparticles that we use, we use on the order of, um, I, I think, I believe it's on the order of nanograms of material. So it's actually quite small, um, but that's a great question about the impact of the nanoparticles once you make them. And so I think um, uh, we, we don't know. We do know there's a lot of regulation now in terms of manufacturing nanomaterials in, in Europe, for example. So you know there are industrial companies that make uh, kilotons of nanotubes, and uh, and so we're watching what they go through and how what kind of regulations that that those have. Um, obviously, it's a concern, and you know this uh, this technology relies on nanoparticles, and so um, the answer is we don't really know, but we're we're keeping an eye on that. I have a question about talk, talk a little bit about the epidemiological impacts of of this test and what it can mean for people tracking diseases. Right, so that's something we're definitely interested in. It we purposely made this to be um, readable by a phone because if you you know you can provide a diagnosis when you look at it with your eye and you can see uh, I have dengue. But what we really wanted to do is to be able to have it be readable by a mobile phone because the mobile phone will provide a time and. GPS stamp um, that's built into the technology. And if you have that information, it can be uploaded to the cloud and be used to generate epidemiological maps to show outbreaks. Um, and so this is something we're, we are definitely thinking uh, towards. Um, many of the um, maps that are created right now, such as those by the World Health Organization, the majority of those are based on news reports. So you can map how outbreaks are moving, but they're not based on actual data. 
Um, and so actual, it's, we want to make that link between the actual diagnosis and where it's spreading. Um, it's, this is incredibly important for things like uh, dengue, because if somebody, if there's a whole community that has a spread of, of dengue moving through, um, the community needs to prepare for the possibility of dengue hemorrhagic fever or dengue shock syndrome. So they need to be able to allocate beds and IV and supportive care for, to, to support those. And so if you have an epidemiological map that's showing where the, the disease is evolving, then that will help you better prepare. So we purposely have been trying to design for this in our device. Any other questions, Rebecca? Sorry, one second, wait for the, thanks. Just to clarify that, so who would use, how would the phones be used in, in the field? That's right, so um, we are hoping that this would be either used by uh, clinicians um, in research poor you know, countries, so basically um, we have collaborators who work in South America, in uh, Colombia, uh, in Nicaragua, and they have clinics where they don't have some sort of um, expensive machine that can tell if somebody has dengue or if they have malaria or if they have chikungunya. And so a rapid test would be able to give the clinician uh, a rapid readout, um, and cell phone technology, um, in addition to that, is very widely available right now. And so almost everybody's got a phone that can take a picture and have a GPS readout. And so um, uh, we um, made this so that it could be used in parallel with those. We purposely did not put any sort of, uh, you can read this with a regular phone. We're purposely writing software that does not need a attachment on the phone. Because if you have an attachment, that means it's another piece of equipment that has to be widely dispersed. So we are making a widely available or a free downloadable phone app that can, uh, so that any phone, even a, a old phone like the clamshell ones, um, can can read this, not just the iPhone 6, but a, an, an old school phone. So the clinician would then use, use their phone and then upload it? That's correct, okay. yes. Yeah. Katie Cottingham, ACS News Service. So what's your false positive, false negative rate, and is this like a definitive diagnostic, or is this just kind of a screening? That's right, so it's really for screening. So this, obviously there are techniques out there that are much more accurate, like PCR and ELISA, and those, we cannot beat that in terms of sensitivity or accuracy, and we're actually not trying to. So we're trying to make this a, as an initial screening tool that will give you a rapid readout within 10 minutes, um, and then if you um, want, if you have access later to a more more sophisticated set of lab equipment, you could go back and definitively say by PCR, yes, this person has chikungunya, or yes, they have dengue. Um, right now, our sensitivity and specificity is actually not bad. It's in the order of 97%. Um, so, uh, and obviously, you know, we're trying to improve that that little bit, but um, so far, we think it's pretty good. We have an online question from Sophia Kai um, from ACS News Service. Does the length of time of infection increase the accuracy of the testing? Uh, okay, so the length of time in infection. So it depends on the disease. So um, for dengue, uh, we it, and the biomarker you're looking for. So for off the top of my head, for dengue, um, the biomarker that we're looking for is non-structural protein one. Uh, it's actually present in your bloodstream. People know the numbers how of the concentrations of NS1 in your bloodstream, and they find that it's very high uh, within. Uh, a, a day or two, so on the order of uh, 15 to 50 micrograms per mil, that's the number I'm remembering. Um, we made our test to be sensitive to uh, about 150 nanograms per mil, so much lower than that. So for that particular disease and that particular biomarker, um, we can detect something early on. Um, however, you know, we're always looking towards the next disease, you know, because there's always some new outbreak somewhere. Um, we, we always keep that in mind, you know, what's the level in blood, and I'm sure that we'll probably run into a situation where some biomarker that we're interested in is too low for us to go after, and so that's where we have to figure out, can we either improve our sensitivity or can we improve um, or go after a different biomarker for that disease? I have just one more question for, are these tests out in the field now? Have you heard back from people in the field that are using them? What kind of feedback have you had? 
That's right. So we actually have um, started deploying these in clinical settings with collaborators. Um, uh, we made some initial tests that ran way too slow, so they would take on the order of 30 minutes um, to run, and and they were like, this is this is this takes too long. And so we did some improvements on the housing, and we were able to reduce that time to about um, you know, 10 minutes or so. And so that was one major improvement that we made. Um, uh, just just simply in the housing. Uh, we're always looking towards uh, what people in the field, uh, how they use it and what they think is um, bad about it. And so we have sent um, um, different prototypes of the device and different pieces. You know, maybe they can assemble it themselves and we can see what, you know, how they use it. And we're still waiting to hear back from, from other folks. But really the, the main one in the beginning was time. How many of you said you, know, you distributed so far? Um, it's uh, it's hard to say. I think we've so far we've given it away to about uh, four different um, sets of uh, organizations slash people. <laughs> yeah, that we that I know of off the top of my head. Um, I'm sure unofficially we've sent it to to some other folks too. So yeah. Sure. Are there any further questions? Mm -hmm. Back. Just one more follow up. To that so these four organizations or people, where are they? They're all in different places. We actually, uh, the most interesting one that I'm really excited about is we most recently sent it to the Wildlife Cons Conservation Society. Um, they're tracking uh, lowland gorillas. Um, they also have um, an outbreak that is killing gorillas. That's a unique setting because um, it's really out in the wild and it's much harder to track gorillas. Um, obviously, you know, for human health uh, aspect, there's crossover when people are either, you know, find an animal in the wild that has been killed by e Ebola or um, they eat the bush meat. And so uh, we, we just sent those uh, just last week. So we're, we, um, we won't hear probably for several months about how, how those tests do. Um, and then we have other organizations, obviously, uh, that are related to clinics um, in Colombia and um, uh, uh, another one in Honduras. And um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm blanking off right now. We have sent some to Africa, um, to people who are traveling to Africa as well. Just one quick clarification. The paper-based you're referring to is the medium in which the the nanoparticle antibody complex sits. So it's sort of impregnated in there. It's not as though the paper is made specially for the test, or how does that work? So it actually, okay, so the paper, it, so basically what happens is there is a, there's a, a pad that you introduce it to. It's kind of like a cotton weave pad. And then the sample wicks through um, it as it quote unquote develops, and that membrane that it's sitting on, it's a nitrocellulose membrane. So we refer to that as as paper, and that's the porous media. And it, you can read it by you can look at it by eye to see a color. Thanks. We are unfortunately out of time, so thank you all very much. The uh, archive version of the session will be uh, soon posted at bitly slash ACS Live Boston. Please join us in just a few minutes for our next press conference today at 1.30 to hear just how common pesticide-resistant lice are in the United States. My scalp is already itching just thinking about it. Thank you all very much.